Culture is complex, multifaceted, and dynamic. All cultures exhibit certain behaviors or have specific characteristics that we can distinguish from those of other cultures. This helps us sort out and categorize a world with mental processes that are predictable and easy to manage. While generalizations of this sort can be helpful in order for us to organize information, we risk making rigid assumptions that what applies to one applies to all. In Buco 260, students identified five dimensions that described how culture is organized. One in particular, some of our group members noticed on our respective link trips, was collectivism versus individualism. Though we are warned that statements about cultures are not necessarily statements about individuals, we often overlook this and find ourselves overgeneralizing and applying these dimensions blindly to cultures. Individualism is best described as when one is emotionally independent from the group and that self-actualization is at the forefront of identity. Individualist cultures approach learning as action-oriented with the purpose of attaining knowledge. On the other hand, collectivism is defined as connection with the power of the group. There are obligations and loyalty to the group when collectivists are expected to share resources. Typically in collectivist cultures, the individual is always defined in relation to a group. The family, the clan, the community, the complicated social system that connects people to one another. The following are personal reflections on our past link trips with the Marshall School. So over spring break, I was fortunate enough to go to um, Chile for the link trip. I knew absolutely nothing about the culture, the business practices, or what to expect. The only image I had of this country was that it was very long on the map, fairly underdeveloped, and that its food and wine were good. Um, but I was soon proven wrong when I stepped, as soon as I stepped out of the airplane. Um, Chile, with its tall buildings and gorgeous landscapes, reminded me so much of Hong Kong that I was utterly shocked. I went on the trip as a blank slate with the basic stereotype, but by the end, came away with new experiences and knowledge. I learned that Chileans value family very much like Asian cultures, which tied in very well with how collective it is. When taking us around to places, our tour guide would always throw in anecdotes from his own family trips and never failed to include his silly stories of his grandchildren. Similarly, when we went to University of Chile and had time afterwards to talk to the students, they were keen on getting to know us um, through our familial backgrounds. Likewise, when we asked one of the representatives from the land airline what his daily schedule looked like, he mentioned he would always go back home for lunch regardless of how late it was, um, and he rarely stayed over time because he didn't want to keep his wife waiting. Slowly, day by day, the image I've had of Chile broke down and new impressions started to take place. I realized that Chile was actually a very developed country with a strong economy. People held strong values, they were very polite and extremely friendly to foreigners. I really didn't process what this all meant until this taking this class though. Um, reflecting upon the trip and looking at the concepts and theories we learned in class, I could actually see why Hasse thought Chile was a collectivist country. Um, I guess stereotypes did fog my initial impression for a few moments, but I've got to say that those were all broken by the end of the trip. I feel that this class had really tied all the loose ends of the trip, making it a nice closure for the overall experience. Asian did not know much about Chile's culture prior to her visit, but during the trip she slowly came to the realization that some of her assumptions were inaccurate. Chile's people, being interdependent and family-oriented, tells one the values of their society. By taking the intercultural communications class, Yejin was able to understand the reasoning behind Chile's collectivist society and other aspects of the culture, which was a nice closure to her trip. So over spring break of my freshman year, I went to Hong Kong for a link. I didn't really know the business or cultural practices of Hong Kong, but I thought I had a good understanding of what I would see there, because I'm from Tokyo, which happens to be like right next to Hong Kong. Growing up in Tokyo, I knew Japan had a collectivist culture, and because Hong Kong is located pretty close to Tokyo, I thought Hong Kong will also show collectivist-like attributes. And, well, it turned out to be right. On one of the business trips, we visited a culinary school and had lunch there. And the students there did everything, from preparing and serving the food, and they even escorted us to the bathroom. It was easy to tell the students apart from the rest of us, because they were all dressed in green aprons, and they moved around in groups of two or more. Judging from the way they dressed, it was obvious that uniformity was stressed at that school. 
Oh, and another thing that I noticed was how the local people lived in tall apartment buildings and not houses. I mean, the apartments literally had like 60 or more floors and there were a lot of them standing right next to each other. I thought people were okay with this kind of densely populated lifestyle only because they valued harmony and the sense of community. It wasn't until this class that made me realize that I had a very narrow view of what I saw in Hong Kong. I learned that I had unconsciously labeled Hong Kong as a collectivist country just because it was right next door to Tokyo. I probably focused more on the things that confirmed my stereotype and overlooked the aspects that didn't really fit into what I thought was collectivist. Like, I completely ignored the fact that people lived in tall apartment buildings simply because there wasn't enough space for everybody to live in houses. I learned that it's too extreme to say one culture is this and that, and that Hong Kong actually has a mix of both individualism and collectivism. Karina first believed that Tokyo and Hong Kong were very similar due to their distance, only to find out later that she was overlooking some of their differences and some cultures are not as high on collectivism as they are perceived. China and Japan might be collectivist cultures, however, cultural dimensions cannot be interpreted in the same way for all countries. This class helped her further understand and break down simplistic ideas. So I was packing for Ling Singapore, and I remember thinking in the back of my head, I really didn't want to bring in something that could get me arrested. And so I spent a good amount of time reading about how I can't bring in chewing gum. It's considered smuggling. This is what got me thinking that things must get pretty boring in Singapore. But based on my conversations with the locals, I can tell you quite a bit about how different it is to grow up in Singapore than it is to see it as a foreigner. So my friends and I heard that taxi drivers could tell you quite a bit about Singapore. So we had this game where we chat up every taxi driver that tours around the city. There was this one really sick taxi driver, remember? His name was Tony. Uh, we met him on our way back from the sands, going to our last event. Uh, he was so chatty, so I figured I'd ask him about how he felt about the Singapore government. Uh, to my surprise, though, he said he felt safe. Uh, he talked about how the government looks out for him and his community. And it really does make sense. Yeah, they give out hardcore lashings and death penalties for crimes the U.S. would probably settle with a little jail time. But when I thought about it, the differences really made sense. Singapore is really clean, and even though you can't chew or spit gum in public, its people didn't know, grow up knowing any other way, and they're okay with the laws its government sets. I really should have remembered that Singapore is largely a collectivist culture, and I didn't see it earlier because we come from a very individualistic one. Uh, this is when cultural dimensions start to really make sense. They were true to an extent, but I thought that considering Singapore a collectivist culture, was too much of a hasty generalization. Regardless, I had one of my best international experiences in Singapore, and I probably would not have enjoyed it as much had I not considered that where I'm from isn't exactly where I'm going. Coming from an individualistic culture, Brian had an extreme idea of what Singapore would be like. But after speaking to locals, he realized that they are more accepting of the rules and regulations. People have different views about what is appropriate in a highly collectivist culture. But from this specific trip and what was taught in class, one can realize that their members do not necessarily object to conforming to society's requirements. We can begin to reconcile these aspects of cultural understanding as long as we don't blindly group all people into one category. It can allow us not only to use general cultural knowledge as a beginning point in our dealing with others, but also to modify our approach as we acquire information specific to the individuals we're hoping to do business with. This video was brought to you by the international team. Bye, Don!